a remote village in Nepal who has been fighting for the rights of young girls and women in Nepal. I have been advocating for the rights of young women and youth for the last eight years. I wish you a very happy International Day of the Girl 2020, and I'm very happy to be moderating today's webinar on the topic, placing gender equality at the heart of education for a new generation. I would like to welcome all the online viewers. Uh, we have hundreds of um, viewers uh, on the platform and countless others watching the event on YouTube. I see participants from dozens of countries have shared where they are joining from. Um, but if you have here on the platform, I'd like to ask you to share your city and country where, where you are joining from. So um, we would like, we would love to know from you. Today's event is available uh, to view in French and English, uh, including sign language. To select which language you want to listen to, simply pick from the drop down menu at the top left hand corner of your screen. Live captioning is also available for today's event. Simply click the CC button on your screen. Um, so um, we want to have as much as interaction with the listener as possible throughout the event and invite you to pose questions and Twitter or, or uh, on the chat function using the hashtags generation inequality, generation equality, I am the first girl, learning never stops. Kindly use those hashtags if you are using any of the mentioned social uh, media. Be sure to include your Twitter handle. Uh, the event host will respond to all your questions after the event if we don't get around to them today. The year 2020 is a milestone moment for accelerating implementation of global commitments to gender equality. 25 years ago, the world committed to improving the rights of all girls and women, no matter who they are or where they live, through the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Despite the commitments made in Beijing to take its strategic bold action, girls are still the most likely to suffer extreme exclusion and world over. The world over. Making up three quarters of children of primary school is who may never set foot in a classroom. In 2018, 130 million girls worldwide were out of school. And only two out of three girls were enrolled in secondary education. In the fragile context of COVID-19 pandemic, we have to act now or we risk losing the gains made over the past 20 years and further widen the gaps and threaten to disrupt the education of more than 11 million girls. So let's let's see the screen of international video girls in crisis. Education had been identified as a cross cutting theme for the six action coalitions, a set of specific, ambitious, and transformative actions to achieve sustainable gender equality that will be launched as the Generation Equality Forum planned for 2021, a global gathering which carries forward the basic platform for action. 
During the next 90 minutes, we will hear young women, ministers, and leaders from different corners of the world adding their voices to generation equality movement, all united by a collective ambition to achieve gender equality in and through education and tackle the unfinished business of the realization of girls and women's right to education. Let's first hear from UNESCO's Director General, Adule Ojule, followed by remarks from UN Women's Deputy Executive Director, Eja Regna, whose organization is leading the development of a visionary new agenda to accelerate progress towards gender equality before 2030. Let's watch the video. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be with you to celebrate the International Day of the Girl Child. Today is an opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to the education of girls and women, not only as a fundamental human right, but also as an effective driver of development for the future of our societies. The international community made this commitment official 25 years ago with the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. In doing so, we acknowledge that when it came to building gender equality, education was the best way forward. Today, as part of uh, the Her Education, Our Future initiative, we are launching our 2020 report on gender equality in education. This document reviews 25 years of efforts to implement this commitment and the scope of the international mobilization. Real progress has been made. In 2018, for example, an equal number of girls and boys were enrolled in primary and secondary school, compared to only 19 gir 90 girls for every 100 boys in 1995. Today, two thirds of all girls receive secondary education, compared to half of all girls in 1998. But the report also shows that we are a long way from fulfilling our commitment to gender equality in education. And this was true even before the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted learning. The need for progress is clear when we consider that three quarters of primary school aged children who may never set foot in schools are girls. Or that only 2% of the poorest rural females in low income countries complete upper secondary school. These inequalities are amplified by enduring norms and prejudices affecting girls, including gender-based violence and early and forced marriage. This is also the conclusion reached in a report on adolescent education over the past 25 years, published by UNESCO, the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs, and Plan International. I thank them for their commitment at our side. The report discusses the obstacles standing in the way of progress towards the commitments made in Beijing. It calls for adolescent education to be central to action plans adopted at the next Gender Equality Forum in 2021. Today's anniversary must be an opportunity to reiterate these commitments and step up our efforts. These efforts are even more important given that the education crisis we are experiencing now has disproportionate effect on the most vulnerable, widening inequalities. COVID-19 is threatening decades of progress, especially in girls' and women's education. According to UNESCO's estimates, an additional 11 million girls may never return to class after the pandemic, joining the 130 million girls already out of school. We must not let the pandemic reverse the progress we have made since 1995. We owe it to the next generations to ensure that the right to education is a reality. This is why UNESCO, through the Global Education Coalition, is working around the world to help member states find innovative distance learning solutions and prepare for school reopening, placing special emphasis on girls' and women's education. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Day of the Girl Child is an opportunity to take stock because before taking action, we must first understand the facts. And this is what our report helps us do. 
This day is also an opportunity to spread hope by showing that solutions do exist. Dear friends, 2020 was meant to be a year of celebration for us. It's 25 years since we adopted the Beijing Declaration on Platform for Action, which is the world's action plan for gender equality. Progress has unfortunately been too slow, but one of the clear gains is actually girls' education and girls' enrollment in schools. However, too many girls and women in society are held back by biases, social norms and expectations, influencing the quality of their educations and also the subject they study, both boys and girls. Girls and women are underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and consequently in STEM careers. On the other hand, career paths in which women are making a very important contribution, which we saw not least during the COVID pandemic, these uh, professions are becoming increasingly technology advanced and they require professionals which are highly trained and prepared for that. And we also have to talk about it in this way. It's not always made visible and valued as highly technical professions. The digital revolution is one of the major shifts that have taken place since the Beijing conference. It has huge impacts on gender equality. The COVID-19 pandemic has made digital tools a lifeline for millions of girls, students and workers, and has shown that the population excluded from the digital world is most at risk of being left behind. By singling out innovation and technology as one of the six action coalition themes, the conveners of the Generation Equality Forum are urging the world to focus on harnessing technology to advance gender equality. The Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation aims to provide girls and women equal opportunities to study and work with technology in STEM and other professions. It will ensure that girls can access digital tools and have the necessary skills uh, to use the devices and stay safe online. It will also ensure that girls have more access to role models and mentors to debunk stereotypes and expand understanding of educational and career pathways in STEM or jobs and professions which are highly reliant on new technology. In addition, all action coalitions will aim to address adolescents' girls' needs, including equal access to education. Thank you so much for having you and women with you today. And I'm really eager to listen to the conversations. And please count on us in all further work on gender equality and girls' rights. We are launching today. We would like to ask you a few questions on your own understanding of achievements and challenges remaining for girls' education. We will do this through a short poll. Uh, to participate, uh, get your phone and go to www.menti.com as soon on the screen. Once the page is open, um, enter the code soon on the screen. It's the first question is, how many more girls are in school today than 25 years ago? at the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. This is the very first question. So here are the possible answers. We have options A, 180 million, B, 50 million, C, 120 million. The correct answer of the answer is A. Yes, today 180 million more girls are enrolled in school than in 1995. Kindly of get ready for the second question of this poll. And the question is, the lockdown and school closures linked to the COVID-19 pandemic have increased girls' experience of Kindly choose your answer from the options. 
So yeah, we have receiving the answers. Well, um, let us let us stop here. Uh, thank you everyone for your active involvement uh, in this poll. And the answer is, and the answer is E, all of the above. We cannot let COVID-19 hold back progress on girls' education. This is the focus of our discussion today. Thank you for your participation. We'll ask you a third and final question at the end of the event. So please stick to us. Please be with us until at the end of the program. If we are going to achieve gender equality in and through education, we have to act together and build partnerships across generations and sectors to address persistent challenges and break the cycle of exclusion. Let's now hear from Manos and Missile, whose organizations are joining forces to bring the issues of gender equality in and through education to the for forefront on International Day of the Girl. Time to coincide with the Beijing Plus 25 review process. They will tell us about two new seminal reports aimed to help countries take the stock of progress towards gender equality in education since 1995 and chart the way forward to achieve tangible results on gender equality and deliver the sustainable development goals. Let us start with the GEM report presentation, watching a short video, a first sort of video. Let, let, let's us uh, watch the 2020 GEM gender report film. Twenty-five years ago, the world committed to advancing the rights of all girls and women, no matter who they are or where they live. Over the years, we have made incredible progress, with more girls now enrolled and completing school than ever before. In my family, there is not a thing about girls and boys. We are all the same and boys and girls are always equal and we should have the same opportunities. But progress has not always been equal and girls are still left facing the worst forms of exclusion. Child marriages is another challenge that we face in our school. Girls are married off early. They have children and are forced to take care of their families. This means that they drop out of school. If we are going to achieve true inclusion for all, we must ensure that we do not leave anyone behind. Around the world, girls' learning outcomes are improving faster compared to boys. However, new gender gaps are forming around digital literacy and STEM subject choices. Even in the most developed countries, girls are less likely to pursue STEM subjects at school and university. This is a result of having career counselling that is not gender responsive, textbooks that still contain gender stereotypes, and teachers who have not yet been trained to address their own attitudes to gender as well. Gender inequality in teacher recruitment, as well as a lack of women in key leadership positions, add to this by reinforcing stereotypes around gender roles. In many developing countries, millions of schools are not inclusive due to their poor infrastructure and unsafe learning environment. Adding to this, school-related gender-based violence remains a threat that leads to young girls dropping out of school. There is no society in the world that has been able to develop uh, in the achievement of sustainable development goals without their girls being in school. To truly achieve success, we must take an intersectional approach that considers not just gender, but race, ethnicity, disability and poverty, and the ways in which these interact for different populations. With the right laws, policies, curricula, and more gender-sensitive teaching, countries can break through. In Malawi, multi-sector partnerships are also helping more young girls return to school after pregnancy. I 
Zamaza Sugulu, Mofon and Zan Zamaria Monoanga, and you will be a bank manager. Achieving truly inclusive education for all cannot happen until unequal gender norms in society have been stamped out. Parents and communities must be invited to work with governments on finding solutions and to confront ongoing gender discrimination taking place around all of us every day. Let's act now and make inclusive access to education available to all. collaboration to this day. You've heard a lot of my um, numbers already by the different interventions so far. So I just would like to take you briefly through the key uh, results of uh, the 2020 gender report, which is the seventh uh, in a row uh, since we launched this series back in uh, 2011. My name is Manos Antoninis. I'm the director of the Global Education Monitoring Report. And we set to produce a report that would be complementary to the 2020 um, global report that focused on inclusion in education, but also to um, address the question of the 25th anniversary of the Momentus Basing Declaration and Platform for Action. As you heard, uh, the, um, the key finding is that there has been progress. Really, the progress that we have made in girls' education has been one of the pillars of the progress that we have made towards gender equality overall in the last 25 years. You heard the, the key finding, 180 million more girls have enrolled in primary and secondary school. That means that gross enrollment ratio among uh, girls in primary and secondary education increased from 73 to 89% in these 25 years, closing a very large gap of eight percentage points that they had with boys. The big progress particularly noted in Southern Asia. Female enrollment has risen by three times in tertiary education, and the report uh, has some interesting findings about how this progress has been particularly interesting in Northern Africa and Western Asia. And learning outcomes, you heard that also uh, on the video, have been overtaking uh, those of boys, uh, which is a major um, finding because it's not only about reading, it's also about science and mathematics. And that's a finding I will come to in a minute. And girls' education in, this, in the uh, past generation is also helping break the cycle uh, of disadvantage. Those girls that we were born in low-income countries in the 1980s uh, have acquired seven more months of education for every year of education that the mothers had received. But that is not enough, it's not the whole story, because girls unfortunately still face the worst forms of acute exclusion. Three quarters of girls, equivalent to nine million girls, um, of those children who may never so set foot in uh, any school ever are girls. And it is those facing intersecting disadvantages that are facing the largest barriers of access. The report shows that there are at least 20 countries, probably quite a few more, where the poor rural girls uh, none of them is actually ensuring that they complete uh, secondary school. Um, that is a target that, if you remember, all girls, all children, all young people should achieve by 2030. And yet, as of the late uh, part of the last decade, in these 20 countries, almost not a single uh, girl, poor girl living in a village was achieving. Legacy uh, of uh, past neglect of women's education means that, unfortunately, throughout this period, 63% of women, um, of, of all adult literates, are women. This is a statistic that sadly has not changed. Of course, these changes will trickle down in the coming years, but it just shows how long it takes for uh, changes to be observed in the population. This report was drafted and decided to focus on the 25th anniversary because of the opportunity that uh, the gender, uh, Generation Equality Forum is providing 
in 2021. This is a, a forum that is tasked the, with the uh, opportunity to develop a new text that would set the new agenda for gender equality in the coming years. The organizers have identified six so-called action coalitions on different themes to inform this uh, new text. Education may not be one of them. However, it has been designated as a cross-cutting theme. And what we have done is to formulate six recommendations that demonstrate education's relevance to each action coalition that we hope will serve as a useful way of displaying the importance of education for girls and women's rights. So starting from the first uh, recommendation, we need to eliminate gender disparity in education access, participation, and completion. We may live in a world of gender parity in primary and secondary education, but this can also be a bit of a, a smoke and mirrors because it is affected by the fact that some of the largest countries have achieved parity and also that the poorest boys in uh, richer countries are actually more likely to leave school early. But the problem of girls access to education has not disappeared. There are fewer than nine females enrolled for every 10 males in 4% of uh, countries in primary, 9% of girls in uh, lower secondary, 15% of countries in upper secondary, and 21% in tertiary education. Discrimination is still alive, either consciously displaced or the result of inertia of past discrimination. It is at the root of the problem that girls and women are facing in generally poor countries. Gaps must be closed with measures related to social protection uh, that target disadvantaged families whose daughters are most vulnerable to uh, the consequences of unequal norms that condemn them to care and housework. While not sufficient, closing the remaining education gender gaps is a necessary condition for realizing economic justice. Secondly, the share of females, as you already heard, in engineering or ICT in tertiary education is below 25% in at least two thirds of countries. This is despite the fact that girls are doing at least as well as boys in mathematics and science in the majority of countries. This discrepancy suggests the urgent need for teachers and counselors to offer gender responsive career orientation to deconstruct false images of technology and their biased connection to gender stereotypes. Programs that redress such imbalances are urgently needed to contribute to technology and innovation for gender equality and prevent the emergent digital literacy gender gaps. Note also that the percentage of female students in technical and vocational education has actually declined from 1995 to 2018 by three percentage points and remains highly gender seg segregated uh, in terms of the different courses. Gender bias in textbooks is still rife. The share of um, females in secondary school uh, language textbooks and, um, was only 44% in Malaysia and Indonesia, 37% in Bangladesh, 24% in uh, Punjab province, Pakistan. And not only girls are and women underrepresented, even where they're included, they're actually uh, demonstrated in traditional roles, reflecting the inertia of past discrimination, as textbooks are slow to change, even when societies uh, around them are trying to change. Yet textbooks are the only books that some children are going to ever read. So they are very powerful tools to promote women's rights. Women, unfortunately, are shown in passive, dependent and domestic roles. So it is necessary to develop gender responsive teaching and learning materials through regular gender audits of textbooks, inclusive processes where women participate and voice their views and uh, support is provided by a properly trained curriculum experts. A gender dimension must be explicit in tenders, terms of reference and contracts for drafting such teaching and learning materials and teachers need also to be trained to use them. The fourth recommendation reminds us that unequal gender power relations are also expressed through gender-based violence and in its school-based form. Violence is an obstacle to achievement of universal secondary education and perpetuates gender unequal norms. Fighting it requires an inclusive school ethos, rules uh, that respect, uh, that, that, that are clear um, and set very clearly what is acceptable and what is not, teachers who are prepared 
so that they take a critical view of their attitudes and stand ready to defend gender equality and engagement with the community so that they uh, report incidents of violence and respond to them. Sanitation facilities need to be improved to strengthen feelings of privacy and safety. And let's not forget that cyberbullying is a new form of violence. 38% of girls were treated in a hurtful or nasty way via social networks. The fifth recommendation is actually uh, very closely related and reminds us also in what uh, a policy paper we launched last year with UNESCO that uh, early marriage and pregnancy further education. Early pregnancy rates are still very high. One in four 18 year olds is a mother in sub Saharan Africa. And yet, there are still two countries that even actively ban pregnant girls from going to school, and about 20 countries that do not really provide the support girls need, pregnant girls and young mothers need to return to school. It is uh, therefore very important that communities uh, no longer harbor prejudices. Uh, they cannot condone child marriages, they cannot tolerate violence. Governments will need to commit to implementing comprehensive sexuality education as a tool to help promote bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health rights. But also we need to overcome two major challenges. First, that many people still hold erroneous beliefs unsupported by evidence about the appropriate content of education, which are often fueled by organized opposition. And secondly, they need to manage the very complex implementation of such reforms in the content of education, because they need to combine financing, teacher education, curriculum content, uh, assessment, monitoring and evaluation, all of these are really complex reforms that require full attention by governments. The sixth recommendation is that while in some low-income countries, especially in rural areas, there are still too few women teaching. However, the teaching profession overall is characterized by feminization. Such gender segregation contradicts commitments to gender equality in the labor market, and it is often linked to perceptions of teaching as a career that better suits women perpetuating gender unequal norms. These norms are also reflected in the limits women are facing in attaining education management and leadership positions. In 48 middle and high income countries, there is a gender gap of 20 percentage points among teachers and head teachers in lower secondary schools. So measures to promote gender equality in education management and leadership would support progress in gender equality in management and leadership positions overall, uh, which is a key factor and key aspect of uh, the equality forum, generation equality forum. That brings me to the end of the presentation. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Together with the report, we are running a campaign. I am the first girl. We have been hearing the stories of girls who are the first in their family to graduate. Some of whose stories appear in the report and others that you will be able to read on our blog in the coming days. We welcome the continuity in donor support to the priority that France and Senegal gave to girls' education three years ago through uh, the um, Global Partnership for Education Replenishment, and also France following Canada through the, uh, its G7 leadership. We just heard the United Kingdom and Kenya put girls' education at the heart of the new GP replenishment campaign, and also that the UK will um, be putting girls' education so also at the heart of their G7 uh, presidency. We stand ready to help with the process, and we feel that there is a real momentum building for change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manos, uh, a very wonderful presentation. With COVID-19 making inequalities even more entrenched, this is a critical point of girls' education. This is vital. The recommendations you mentioned are heard by those working on the generation equality for next year. It is now time for our audience to have a say on what had just been said. I invite all of you watching to write in the comment section uh, which policies would you like to be uh, outlined as strategic um, underpoints for girls' and women's rights and gender equality in the next declaration of the new generation. Making sure these relations are heard is up to the whole education community and beyond. If any of you listening are also working on advocating around the Generation Equality Forum, we invite you to share your uh, initiatives and how we can support uh, the chat during this event.
Let us now hear from Michelle to learn more about a joint report also published today in international the French Ministry on accelerating adolescent girls' education and empowerment. Michelle is the advocacy and youth engagement director of the NGO Plan International France. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Benita. Uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. Uh, this is really my pleasure today to present you the report called Beijing 25, Generation Equality Begins with Adolescent Girls' Education. This is a joint report from the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Plan International France and UNESCO. I'd like to start this presentation quoting a passionate adolescent girl advocate from Paraguay. Next, please. She says, I get goosebumps when I realize that 25 years ago, women were already fighting for our rights. Knowing what happened 25 years ago encourages us to keep on fighting for the rights of the girl. Well, this is all about it. Tremendous progress has been made, but we need to continue the fight for gender equality together with the new generation. Next, please. The main objective of this report is to examine progress and persistent gaps in our efforts to achieve gender equality in and through education since the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action adopted in 1995 and to clarify priority actions to be implemented within the framework of the Beijing 25 process and the action coalitions of the Generation Equality Forum and Sustainable Development Goals. The report also aims at promoting adolescent girls' voices and expectation and share inspiring studies, tools, and initiatives from a variety of partners and countries. Next, please. Importantly, the report also aims to inform the six action coalitions that are being established in the context of the Generation Equality Forum taking place in 2021 which are catalyzing action on six areas of the unfinished agenda laid out in Beijing, with a call to place adolescent girls' education at the very heart of the action coalitions. Next, please. Why? Having a focus on adolescent girls' education. Well, because this is a virtuous cycle. Research has shown that a girl who has access to a comprehensive and quality primary and secondary education is more likely to realize her sexual and reproductive health rights, to say no to an early and forced marriage and to avoid early pregnancy, to have access to an employment or an income generating activity and to be economically empowered, to participate in decision-making in her family, community, and to take part in public life. Next, please. So what progress and obstacles are we talking about? Over the past 25 years, enrollment rates for girls have improved significantly, and we have heard in the last presentation a lot about the progress achieved so far. Let me just highlight two key figures. Globally, parity in primary and secondary education was achieved in 2009, and an additional 180 million girls were enrolled in primary and secondary education in 2018 compared to 1995. Also, two out of three girls are now enrolled in secondary education compared to one out of two girls only in 1998. Next, please. Nevertheless, those improvements hide disparities and obstacles that are still significant, particularly at secondary level. Parity has only been achieved by one country out of four in upper secondary school. And disparities in participation and learning are exacerbated by different vulnerability factors that may interact with gender, such as wealth status of the country and the family, place of residence, whether urban or rural, ethnicity, disability, conflict or crisis context. There are persistent obstacles, which are linked to poverty and economic hardship, social and cultural norms, which remain a major obstacle to girls' access and retention in school, especially once they reach puberty and are assigned to a role of wives and mothers instead of learners able to design their own future. 
child marriage often results in early and in intended pregnancy and social isolation. It interrupts schooling, limits employment opportunities, and makes girls more vulnerable to domestic violence. School-related gender-based violent violence has an impact on the quality of learning and is a key factor in adolescent girls dropping out of school. Next, please. This publication focuses in particular on three major educational levers of action needed to advance the Beijing agenda. It provides case studies highlighting good practice in these areas. Next, please. Those key levers are comprehensive sexuality education at school and at community level. Comprehensive sexuality education is at the intersection of rights to education, to health, to participation and protection. Also the education and career orientation of adolescent girls in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, the, the so-called STEM and adolescent girls' leadership development, both in and out of school, in order to foster their capacity to influence decisions affecting them and to foster their participation in political and economical decision-making spaces. Case studies from around the world, along with the voices of hundreds of adolescent girls recently consulted by Plan International in 12 countries, helped us understand their priorities and expectations what works and how to take this forward. Next, please. This report does propose some recommendations which are addressed to all stakeholders involved in policies and programs for adolescent girls' education and more broadly for the promotion of gender equality and the sustainable development goals. Next. Our first recommendation is for those involved in the Gender Equality Forum, while the others are more broader. First one is to place adolescent girls' education, formal and non-formal, at the heart of the six themes of the Generation Equality Forum Action Coalitions. Secondly, collect and use age and sex disaggregated data to inform planning to address adolescent girls' need, including in crisis contexts. Invest in education, which transforms social and cultural norms, holding adolescent girls back with adequate policies and funding. In particular, ensure investments in three levers of action, quality comprehensive sexuality education, gender responsive STEM education, and adolescent girls leadership development. This report entails specific recommendations for each of those three areas considered as levers of success. Next, please. Promote inclusive multi-stakeholder partnerships and collaboration that work across sectors to address adolescent girls' needs in a holistic way. Engage adolescent, girls-led and feminist organizations, parents and communities in decision-making spaces on education, ensuring representation from the most marginalized adolescent girl, and strengthen movements, networks and associations of adolescents so that they can contribute meaningfully to these processes. And last but not least, ensure attention in context of crisis and fragility to the specific situations of risk faced by adolescent girls, including the risk of permanent school dropout and violence that may be exacerbated by the COVID-19 health crisis. Next, please. To conclude this presentation, let me share with you the vision of Chanceline, a powerful young woman from Benin. She says, my vision is to contribute to the birth of a new generation of young girls who are actors of development, girls who have access to learning opportunities and to sexual health education in order to make decisions and thrive healthily, girls who are fighting to make their dreams come true, girls who fight against inequality. Let's endorse this vision and make it all together a reality by guaranteeing the right to education for all adolescent girls and boys. Thanks for your attention.
thank you, Missel. We just heard from Missel the persistent challenges, but also the levers of action to ensure adolescent girls' education and achieve a gender equality generation. We are now joined by five representatives from government, civil society, and regional organizations to discuss their efforts to deliver concrete game-changing results in education across generations for girls and women. Thank you all for joining the discussion to mark International Day of the Girl 2020. Vice Minister Kela, firstly, congratulations. Finland is getting the bar for women in leadership with the world's youngest female prime minister and a record number of young women in leadership positions across government, yourself included. Yet, the Finnish experience is very much exception. The rising rates of female education have not shifted deeply entrenched occupational uh, segregation in both developed and developing countries, and despite doing just as well as boys in classroom. Social and institutional barriers still discourage girls from taking up careers based on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So my question would be to you is, uh, the first question is, what action is required from education policy makers to ensure that girls free girls feel free, supported uh, in the subjects and careers they choose to pursue, including those in which they are often underrepresented uh, as such in this thing. And the second question is, what piece of advice would you give to young women and girls who wish to pursue a leadership position in government? What are the core attributes they need to nurture to follow their dream? Over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your kind words. And good evening, everyone. First, I wish to thank UNESCO, France, and Plan International for organizing the event. Our discussion is timely, as millions of girls worldwide are at risk of dropping out of school due to COVID-19. The pandemic has se severe impacts on women and girls. It is crucial to increase investments in education which is a strong equalizer and provides the best safeguard against exclusion and lack of prospects. To your first question, promoting women's role in STEM must start with equity, equality and inclusion in education. As a small nation, this is the number one lesson in Finland. We simply cannot afford losing the potential of any individual in society. Measures to improve welfare and support for learning must be strong. It is important to look at the segregation of professions. In case of Finland, working life is strongly segregated and separation of men and women into different fields begins early. We have a paradox where girls, girls do well in basic education and even outperform boys in mathematics and science, but boys are more likely to continue studies and choose career paths in technology technological fields. We must better study the pull and push factors and see young people's educational choices as a processes in which one's own school success, confidence and self-image, as well as family, social risk relations, hobbies and cultural phenomena are relevant. Media and role models also play a role. Interventions must be cross-sectoral combining education, employment, and youth policies. In Finland, we are currently strengthening gender equality planning in teacher education and in the work of study counselors. We also have a national network in universities with a mission to find innovative ways to boost science education and increase the interest of children and youth, especially girls in science. To continue, we are preparing a comprehensive study on gender equality in research and innovation. We will draw up an accessibility plan for higher education, as our aim is to increase the share of higher education graduates to 50% of young adults by 2030. Equality will be strengthened in all levels of education, as we want to make sure that all Finnish citizens, girls and boys, 
have a solid base for employment and lifelong learning. As a central measure, we will extend the minimum school leaving age up to 18 years. All material fees for upper secondary education will be abolished so that education is completely free for every student. We will also improve student guidance and welfare services. Dear all, as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the most progressive document ever on the rights of women and girls, Finland is taking part in a global generation equality campaign. As a co-leading country in the Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation, our vision is to bridge the gender di divides in digitalization. Education, training and science will play a key role here. For your second question, first I wish to emphasize that equality is a matter of all society. It is up to political, political decision makers to be built to build an environment with strong legislation that enables, supports, and encourages women to pursue in leadership positions in all sectors of society. It is important to have more women engaged in politics in order to strengthen equality in all policy planning. After decades of global progress, we must be alarmed about the impacts of COVID-19, but also about the increased attempts to challenge women's and girls' rights including sexual and reproductive health and rights. Finland is committed to taking the global gender equality agenda to the next level and remove the systemic barriers to gender equality. As uh, the moderator said, in Finland, the share of women in political decision-making is high. Currently, a record number of almost half of members of the parliament are women. 11 out of 19 ministers of the government are women, including Prime Minister Sanna Marin, who at the time of nomination was also the youngest in the world to hold that position. 49% of all active workforce in Finland are women. The number of women directors in business and enterprises is among the highest in the world. We aim to continue on that path. Finland strives to become a leading country in gender equality According to World Economic Forum, Finland is currently the third most gender equal country in the world. As the first to grant all men and women full political rights more than 100 years ago, Finland has a strong legacy to build on. This would not have been possible without decisive decisions to provide everyone an equal opportunity in life. Harnessing the potential of every individual is not only morally correct, but also a smart policy in terms of well-being and prosperity. Finland was recently once again ranked by the UN as the world's happiest nation. So my advice to girls and young women would be dream big, hold on to that dream and believe that change is possible. Education is the key. Become a positive agent of transformation and be persistent. Raise your voice and demand the global community to do better. Root your actions in universal human rights and the promise of the 2030 agenda of not leaving anyone behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minakila, for your wonderful remarks and answering all the questions. We know that education can give women and girls the life skills they need to exist to an uncertain future, to stand up to discrimination and violence, and to make decisions about healthcare, including sexual and reprodu reproductive health. Countries need to focus on making schools more inclusive to all students, no matter their background, ability, or inability, particularly in the face of COVID-19, which has accelerated already existing inequality. This requires better sanitation facilities in schools, greater attention on school-related gender-based violence, particularly in online fora, and inclusive policies enabling pregnant girls 
to go to schools and come back after. Uh, we will be having French sign language interpretation for the next three speakers. Uh, I'd like to inform all the respected uh, participants. We are joined by a representative from Senegal's Ministry of Education, Ms. Marie Bobo Sibi, uh, the technical advisor to the minister. Uh, uh, dear um, Marie, uh, my question uh, would be to you is, uh, the first is, Senegal has seen greater strides in women's and girls' education over the past 25 years. Can you share some insights uh, into the ministry's efforts to foster girl-friendly schools, such as addressing gender imbalance within the teaching profession? And the second question is, in the context of global pandemic, the sanitation of a school is even more critical than before. What efforts has your ministry led to improve sanitation and menstrual hygiene facilities in a school? Both essential uh, measures to reduce um, absenteeism of uh, the facilitated girls, uh, orientation in adolescent, sorry, in adolescents. So these two questions are to you, Ms. Marie. Over to you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Comme vous l'avez dit, le Sénégal a déployé un certain nombre d'efforts. Je dois rappeler que nous sommes partis justement de 1995. Après Beijing, nous avons tenu une, un forum national sur l'éducation des filles parce qu'en son temps, on avait un taux brut de scolarisation des filles qui était à, peu, à moins de 45 Donc, suite à la tenue de ce forum, le Sénégal s'était fortement engagé, je, je peux ne pas revenir sur ça, donc au niveau international avec les conférences, les grandes conférences, les, les grandes sessions des MINEDAF de la CONFEMEN, mais aussi participation forte à, à, au partenariat de Lungai. Et tout cela nous a permis justement d'aborder la problématique de l'égalité des sexes à l'école sous différents angles avec une approche qu'on appelle l'approche STAR, basée sur d'abord la situation, les tâches, les actions à mener et les résultats obtenus. La situation, nous partons du cadre réglementaire avec le, la loi d'orientation de 1991, loi 91-22, modifiée en 2004, justement qui fait de l'égalité des sexes une réalité dans le secteur de l'éducation. Et cela nous poussait justement à promouvoir l'éducation des filles. L'approche STAR, c'est d'abord la situation aussi au-delà du cadre réglementaire. Il y a eu une analyse situationnelle. Comment, justement, quels sont les obstacles à l'éducation des filles? Une étude a été menée dans ce sens. Et au-delà de cette étude, nous avons ajouté une autre socio-anthropologique maintenant pour permettre d'encadrer de, les réalités socio-culturelles au niveau de chaque localité. Vous l'avez dit tantôt, un nouveau défi est venu se greffer malheureusement à ça. C'est justement la problématique de la COVID-19, mais aussi l'accès des filles aux filières scientifiques. Il fallait d'abord qu'elles entrent. Si elles entrent, qu'elles y restent. Mais au-delà de cela, comment faire pour que nos filles soient justement dans les écoles et aussi au niveau des filières scientifiques. Un certain nombre d'actions, nous, nous l'avons dit, le, le, la dynamique partenariale a été vraiment un, un élément important dans nos actions. Donc, la synergie des actions avec la création d'un cadre fédérateur de toutes les interventions sur l'éducation des filles, des actions en termes d'élaboration d'outils, des outils de formation des décideurs, du corps de contrôle, des enseignants, l'institutionnalisation d'une journée nationale de l'éducation des filles le 11 novembre, donc un mois après le 11 octobre. J'ai parlé de la création du cadre fédérateur qui est le cadre de coordination des interventions sur l'éducation des filles, l'élaboration d'un plan de développement de l'éducation des filles, mais aussi l'institutionnalisation des bureaux genre par décret présidentiel depuis 2012. Donc, dans, au niveau des concentrés, 
dans chaque inspection d'académie, dans chaque inspection de l'éducation et de la formation, il y a un bureau en charge des questions d'égalité de sexe, un bureau genre. Et cela nous a valu des résultats importants, je pense qu'on l'a dit, elles entrent plus au Sénégal à tous les niveaux, au primaire, au moins comme au secondaire, l'indice de parité est partout en faveur des filles. Au primaire, il est de 1,17, au moins 1,19, au secondaire, 1,09, il y a encore des, des efforts à faire. Et cette année, au niveau des résultats des examens, justement, le taux de réussite des filles est plus élevé à tous les niveaux que celui des garçons. Maintenant, tout cela, justement, nous, nous, nous a aussi enseigné qu'il y a un élément fédérateur qu'il faudrait considérer. Comme le dit souvent M. le ministre de l'Éducation nationale, qui veut toucher l'élève passe par l'enseignant. Donc, si nous voulons offrir à la communauté des exemples de réussite de femmes, il n'y a pas mieux que les femmes enseignantes. Raison pour laquelle nous avons développé au Sénégal ce que nous avons appelé le plan de promotion de la femme enseignante pour son accès au poste de responsabilité. Ce plan de promotion permet aux femmes de gagner des postes, c'est une compétition et on leur a accordé ce qu'on appelle le bonus genre. Au-delà du bonus genre, il y a maintenant des postes priorité femmes, des postes de responsabilité au niveau desquels seules les femmes compétissent. Et s'il n'y a pas maintenant de femmes qui aient gagné ce poste, on peut l'attribuer à un enseignant. Et toujours dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre de ce plan de promotion de la femme enseignante, nous avons Aujourd'hui, plus de 14 des femmes qui ont accès au poste de responsabilité. C'est vrai qu'on n'est pas encore à la parité, mais au moins, nous sommes partis de 2,52 des effectifs femmes à 14 des effectifs des femmes qui, justement, ont gagné des postes de responsabilité. Au niveau maintenant de, euh, central, au niveau de l'administration centrale, je pense des efforts importants ont été déployés aussi. Au ministère de l'Éducation nationale, la directrice de cabinet, c'est une femme, la secrétaire générale du ministère aussi. Nous avons quatre femmes directrices nationales, des inspectrices d'académie, des inspectrices de l'éducation et de la formation, la doyenne de l'inspection générale de l'éducation et de la formation, qui est aussi une femme, et des femmes coordonnatrices de projets. Donc, c'est dire que des efforts énormes sont faits pour avoir autant de femmes modèles à tous les niveaux, ce qui a stimulé justement non seulement l'accès à la fonction enseignante, mais le maintien des filles, surtout dans les localités les plus reculées, où nous avions besoin de femmes modèles. Je l'ai dit, face justement à cette pandémie maintenant de la COVID-19, il nous fallait travailler à maintenir les acquis que nous avons. Aujourd'hui, on ne peut pas parler de décrochage parce que nous n'avons pas encore justement les, les effectifs en termes de reprise des cours. Les cours reprennent au mois de novembre. Mais au moins pour les classes d'examen, nous savons qu'il n'y a pas eu beaucoup de décrochage de filles, c'est moins 0,0 et quelques pourcents. Et les résultats nous montrent à suffisance que les filles sont bien présentes. Pourquoi? Parce que quand il nous fallait développer le plan de résilience du ministère face à la COVID, un accent particulier a été mis sur ce que nous avons appelé les procédures opératoires normalisées pour un protocole sanitaire, donc permettant à l'école de reprendre les cours pour les classes d'examen, mais aussi d'assurer la sécurité de ses élèves. Et justement, au niveau du, du, du protocole sanitaire, il est dit clairement que ne pourront être ouvertes que les écoles disposant d'eau courante. Euh, donc, euh, ces écoles ne seront ouvertes que les écoles disposant de toilettes ou de latrines séparées pour les filles et les garçons, équipées en eau et en savon, et les déchets de tous ordres doivent être éliminés tous les jours. Et avec l'appui de nos partenaires, des kits hygiéniques ont été mis à la disposition de certains établissements pour accompagner les filles en période de monstre. 
nous savons que si l'eau est disponible, si nous avons euh, le nécessaire pour leur permettre de se nettoyer et de se prendre en charge en période de menstru, on aura gagné cinq jours par mois pour chaque fille. Donc, euh, elle se représente et les résultats nous montrent à suffisance justement que notre stratégie a bien payé. Et au-delà donc des moyens financiers, il y a la disponibilité des points d'eau, des toilettes séparées, distantes, mais surtout deux structures du ministère que nous avons mises à contribution. Les centres nationaux d'orientation scolaire et professionnelle et les institutions médicales des écoles pour une prise en charge psychosociale des élèves à se créer certaines difficultés, en tout cas au niveau des élèves et des parents. Pour justement les accompagner et les encadrer, il a été mis en place ce qu'on a appelé des cellules d'appui, de veille et d'appui psychosocial, donc à tous les niveaux. À la fin des cours pour les classes d'examen, nous avons noté 4885 interventions de ces structures, dont 52 ont concerné des filles qu'on a aidées à rester à l'école. Et des fois, c'est sur demande des parents d'ailleurs que ces cellules ont été saisies. Au-delà de tout ça, nous avons aussi euh, une école de la communauté et um, de la communauté avec um, des associations. Thank you, Marie. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful answer. Qui nous ont aidé à mettre. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to move ahead with uh, another amazing speaker. Um, France has shown international leadership when it comes to girls and women's education. In the G7 ministerial meeting on education and development in July 2019, <laughs> President <laughs> Macron called on G7 countries to make girls' education a priority of the external cooperation and development aid. France is also the co-chair of Generation Equality Forum to set take place in the first half in 2021. So I'd like to request Mrs. Rogan Lacan uh, as ambassador at the permanent delegation of France at UNESCO. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. So my question would be to you is, financing for results with be a poor part of the forum's agenda. How can we address systematic resources gaps and have so far hampered, hampered progress towards gender equality in, in and through education? And the second question would, would be, we have just heard from Ms. Sivi about inequalities affecting the education of girls across Africa. How is France working with African countries to uh, champion the importance of education as an uh, enabler and girls and women's rights across the continent. Over to you. Merci beaucoup, Binita. Merci à toutes et à tous. Bonjour. Merci à l'UNESCO pour euh, à l'UNESCO et à la Fondation Plan International France pour la co-organisation de cet événement et pour le partenariat de qualité qui les unit au ministère de l'Europe et des Affaires étrangères de la France pour la troisième année consécutive à l'occasion de la journée internationale des filles. Merci à euh, mesdames euh, les ministres qui ont été avec nous euh, cet après-midi. Nous nous félicitons que ce partenariat ait franchi une étape supplémentaire avec la préparation du forum euh, Génération euh, Égalité en partenariat avec ONU Femmes et le Mexique. Et ce, ce forum est une priorité pour nous pour les prochains mois, nous souhaitons que ce rendez-vous international permette à la communauté et à l'ensemble des acteurs concernés de prendre de nouveaux engagements concrets en faveur de l'égalité des droits des femmes et des filles. La question des financements est essentielle et évidemment, elle se décline en deux types de financements. Les financements domestiques et nationaux, pour commencer, qui doivent prendre en compte les légalités de genre dans l'éducation. Il faut s'assurer donc que les États consacrent une part significative de leur budget à l'éducation, autour de 20%, comme le préconise l'UNESCO, et qu'un montant suffisant soit dédié à l'atteinte des objectifs d'égalité de genre dans l'éducation. 
Il y a ensuite, donc on vient de parler des financements nationaux, il y a les financements internationaux et bilatéraux pour permettre la mise en œuvre d'actions spécifiques visant l'égalité de genre dans l'éducation. C'est notamment ce que nous, la France, nous poussons dans le cadre de la reconstitution des fonds du partenariat mondial pour l'éducation, qui devrait intervenir à l'été 21, et de l'élaboration de la nouvelle stratégie du partenariat, qui devrait inclure l'égalité de genre comme un axe majeur. Notre Agence française de développement met également les actions de promotion et de prise en compte de l'égalité de genre au cœur de ses interventions dans le secteur de l'éducation et de la formation professionnelle. Nous contribuons, la France contribue aux actions de l'UNESCO en faveur de l'éducation des filles, dont la campagne « Son éducation, notre avenir » par l'intermédiaire de notre contribution annuelle de 7,5 millions d'euros en 2020, dont 6,5 millions ont été, sont consacrés à l'éducation. Mais la mobilisation des fonds ne suffit pas à elle, à elle seule. Il faut que ces fonds, bien sûr, soient utilisés de manière efficace et efficiente. Dans ce cadre, il s'agit de s'assurer que des analyses approfondies des besoins et des barrières concernant l'éducation des filles soient menées systématiquement avec la plus grande rigueur. Les solutions proposées doivent être pertinentes au vu des besoins et des barrières identifiées qui le plus souvent dépassent les enjeux scolaires et touche aux normes et pratiques sociales défavorables aux filles, la favorisation des garçons, le travail domestique des filles, les mariages d'enfants. Voilà des pratiques qui peuvent s'avérer dramatiques pour la vie d'une jeune fille et auxquelles il faut mettre fin. Enfin, il nous faut mettre en place des partenariats multi-acteurs et multisectoriels pour aborder l'enjeu de l'éducation des filles de manière intégrée. Les différents ministères doivent coopérer les uns avec les autres, mais également avec la société civile, les acteurs locaux, la communauté, euh, et des parents, et s'assurer que toutes les actions mises en œuvre touchent l'ensemble des publics et traitent euh, de lutte contre les mariages d'enfants, de grossesse précoce, euh, de lutte contre les violences de genre en milieu scolaire. Tout ça doit être efficace. S'agissant, Binita, de votre deuxième question, nous venons d'entendre la ministre Tala parler de ces inégalités. Nous, avons, nous, la France, avons fait de cette égalité entre femmes et hommes notre priorité. Le président de la République, Emmanuel Macron, en a fait la grande cause de son mandat. La stratégie française pour la politique étrangère dans le domaine de l'éducation, de la formation professionnelle et de l'insertion, qui fixe les orientations pour nos interventions dans ce secteur, euh, doit renforcer nos actions à destination des publics les plus vulnérables, en particulier les jeunes filles, comme les axes majeurs de notre intervention. La France soutient l'accès des filles à une éducation de qualité et leur maintien à l'école, notamment au niveau secondaire, en encourageant l'inclusion de ces objectifs dans la conception et la mise en œuvre de politiques éducatives des pays partenaires, notamment sur le continent africain. Nous consacrons nos, nos engagements financiers à développer des environnements scolaires favorables à l'apprentissage pour les filles, exemptes de, violent, de violence de genre, des infrastructures sanitaires et d'hygiène adéquates, notre collègue du Sénégal qui a parlé juste avant moi en a parlé en détail, c'est essentiel, infrastructures d'hygiène, savon, eau, des programmes scolaires dépourvus de préjugés sexistes et formation des enseignants sur ces enjeux et nécessité encore une fois d'accroître le nombre de femmes dans le corps enseignant car celles-ci sont minoritaires dans de nombreux pays. Euh, mon pays, la France, soutient par ailleurs la lutte contre les mariages forcés et les grossesses précoces et non désirées, et l'accès à toutes les filles, mais, euh, mais aussi à tous les garçons, à l'éducation complète à la sexualité. Dans ce cadre, la France soutient le financement du programme du Bureau régional de l'UNESCO à Dakar, le programme O3, en anglais « Our Lives, Our Rights, Our Future », ça veut dire « Nos droits, nos vies, notre avenir », c'est pour ça que O3 qui porte sur l'éducation et la santé, et notamment la santé sexuelle et reproductive, 
à hauteur de 2 millions d'euros. La politique de coopération française encourage également l'orientation des femmes vers le secteur des STEM, le développement de la participation des femmes à l'enseignement technique et à la formation professionnelle. Nous promouvons ces actions, notamment dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre de l'initiative « Priorité à l'égalité » lancée par le G7 sous présidence française en 2019. Cette initiative, mise en œuvre conjointement par l'Initiative des Nations Unies pour l'éducation des filles, UNGEI et l'Institut international pour la planification de l'éducation de l'UNESCO, IIPE, vise à accompagner huit pays pilotes, Mauritanie, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, Tchad, Sierra Leone, Nigeria et Mozambique, pour renforcer l'égalité filles-garçons dans tous les aspects de leur système éducatif. Curricula, un enjeu essentiel pour l'éducation pour nous, infrastructure, formation des enseignants, gestion des écoles, prévention des violences liées au genre. La France soutient cette initiative à hauteur de 4,5 millions d'euros en 2020, dont un soutien à l'IIPE de 2,5 millions d'euros et un soutien à l'UNGEI de 2 millions d'euros. Nous nous assurons également que la problématique de l'éducation des filles est dûment prise en compte dans les actions appuyées par les organisations internationales notamment, comme je l'ai évoqué plus tôt, celle du partenariat mondial pour l'éducation. Et nous développons des partenariats avec des organisations de la société civile qui sont souvent à la pointe des approches innovantes pour accompagner les transformations sociales sur le terrain. En gros, nous sommes engagés. Nous vous remercions tous et toutes pour votre engagement et nous ne pouvons que continuer. Merci à toutes. Merci, Vinita. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Rogan Lakan, uh, for your wonderful answers. I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, the generation equality movement demands urgent action and accountability for gender equality, accelerating the power of girls' and women's rights activism, feminist solidarity, and youth leadership to achieve transformative and sustainable change. Young people have been actively involved in the action coalitions, which will set the pace, pace for progress towards gender equality before 2030. Yet, despite their agency, women and girls are often excluded from decision-making processes due to lack of education, high unemployment, and poverty. Let us hear from Flematu. Uh, Flematu is a 24 years old woman from Guinea. She is an advocate for girls' rights and children's rights in her country since 2016 as a co-founding member of a club named Young Girls Leaders from Guinea Club. So my question would be to Flematu is that, uh, Flematu, uh, growing up in uh, Guinea, what was the first barrier you experienced in your education and how did you overcome it? And the next question is, uh, businesses as usual will not uh, suffice uh, the achieve, to achieve gender equality in and through education once and for all. What urgent message do you want to give to the world leaders as we enter into the decade of action for gender equality? Over to you. Euh, merci beaucoup pour les deux questions, Bineta. Euh, les obstacles, pour la première question, l'obstacle auquel j'ai été confrontée, mais, euh, être né dans une famille où la, la scolarisation n'est pas une priorité pour euh, les filles, mais plutôt les travaux ménagers, tel a été mon obstacle. Parce que au lieu de me, au lieu d'aller euh, à l'école tôt le matin, il fallait d'abord faire des travaux ménagers avant de partir. Chose qui me mettait en retard. Ce genre de situation freine euh, vraiment la scolarisation, euh, favorise la déscolarisation de beaucoup de filles dans mon pays, même si moi j'ai pu quand même m'en sortir. Et ce qui m'a permis d'aller de, de l'avant dans mes études, c'est d'abord ma motivation. Euh, à l'école primaire, je voyais en école, à, je voyais dans l'école un moyen pour moi de de, de fuir les travaux ménagers, et un espace d'échanger avec mes camarades d'âge. Et ce n'est qu'arrivé au secondaire que j'ai compris toute l'importance de l'éducation. Alors là, je me suis fortement impliquée dans mes études, malgré la distance à parcourir et, et les attitudes peu encourageantes des, des professeurs. 
dans les jeunes rurales, dans les jeunes rurales, le problème d'accès des filles à la scolarisation est, est vraiment renforcé du fait de la distance à parcourir pour être à l'école, chose qui incite les parents à garder leurs enfants avec eux à la maison ou parfois, euh, parfois leur donner un mariage, euh, un mariage précoce. Et le mariage précoce est un frein supplémentaire pour euh, la scolarisation de la jeune fille et sans compter son impact sur la santé et aussi l'avenir de la fille et de ses enfants. Pour ces cas, je, je me permets de donner et de partager avec vous un exemple de, de Fanta, l'exemple de Fanta. Fanta est une jeune fille, une jeune femme âgée de 24 ans que j'ai rencontrée lors de mon passage dans une localité de la Guinée où je faisais la sensibilisation sur l'importance de l'éducation de la jeune fille. Fanta est mère de trois enfants, dont deux filles. Elle a abandonné l'école parce qu'il n'y avait pas de secondaire dans son, dans son village pour, par crainte pour pour sa sécurité et son honneur, s'il l'a laissé partir habiter ailleurs, ses parents le gardant avec eux au village. Alors, elle s'est retrouvée mariée contre son gré à l'âge de, à l'âge de 15 ans. Son frère, par contre, lui, a pu se rendre au, au, au collège et Fanta nous a confié vraiment de ne pas souhaiter eh, la même chose à ses filles, c'est-à-dire les obstacles auxquels elle a été confrontée parce qu'il n'existait pas de secondaire dans son village, que ses filles ne soient pas confrontées à ces mêmes, à ces mêmes obstacles. Et vous allez constater que mon cas est le cas de le Fanta est un peu différent. Pourquoi Parce que moi, je suis née dans la zone urbaine et grandie là. Et Fanta est née dans la zone rurale et grandie aussi là-bas. Mais ces, ces deux problèmes sont vraiment eh, le, le problème des milliers de filles de la Guinée, que ce soit en zone urbaine ou en zone rurale. Et ce qui concerne la deuxième question que m'avait posée eh, Bineta, et pour cette deuxième question des messages prioritaires que j'ai à faire passer aux dirigeants du monde entier pour vraiment apporter un changement, pour que vraiment le rapport soit de qualité, et, et j'ai préparé des recommandations que je vais commencer à dicter pour, pour atteindre l'égalité de genre dans et à travers l'éducation, il faut favoriser la scolarisation des filles et leur maintien à l'école au niveau primaire et secondaire surtout. Pour cela, il faut investir financièrement dans les systèmes éducatifs transformateurs de rapports de genre. Et cela passe par des mesures d'ordre économique, et des mesures d'ordre économique, par aussi l'amélioration de l'offre éducative, par aussi l'amélioration de la qualité de l'éducation surtout, mais aussi la promotion du de leadership des filles à l'école. Et quand on prend des mesures d'ordre économique pour lever des freins économiques à l'éducation des filles, il faut des activités génératrices de revenus pour les parents dans les zones rurales, tout en leur exigeant d'inscrire leurs enfants à l'école. La promotion de bourses d'études pour des filles dans les zones rurales pour qu'elles accèdent au niveau secondaire. La promotion de bourses pour des filles qui obtiennent leur bac puissent poursuivre des études supérieures et aussi les dons en kit scolaire. Quand on prend l'amélioration de l'offre éducative, il faut la construction de plus d'écoles publiques dans les zones rurales et leur équipement adapté. Quand on prend l'amélioration de la qualité de l'éducation, il faut surtout l'intégration de l'hygiène menstruelle. Il faut surtout l'intégration de l'hygiène menstruelle et de l'éducation complète à la sexualité dans les, dans les programmes scolaires. Il faut aussi l'enseignement de l'égalité de genre aux enseignants, tout comme aux élèves. La promotion du leadership des filles à l'école et en dehors de l'école. Par exemple, en célébrant des, mondes, des, des modèles de ressources féminines pour encourager les autres à emboîter le pas des aînés est très important. En mettant des moyens à la disposition des organisations de jeunes, notamment des organisations conduites par des jeunes filles pour plus d'actions communautaires. Pour terminer mes recommandations, pour terminer, j'aimerais demander aux leaders et à toutes les parties prenantes qui m'écoutent en ce moment d'inscrire l'éducation des adolescentes au, au cœur des coalitions d'action et des plans d'action à 5 ans qui seront développés lors du forum Génération Égalité. Car sans l'éducation des adolescentes, il n'y aura pas d'atteinte d'égalité de genre. Je vous remercie.
Merci Vineta. Thank you very much, Flimatu. Uh, Now we have a film called Learning Never Stop Film by UNESCO. My first question would be to you, Rabia, is South Asia continues to be a reason where poverty, uh, reality, and sociocultural factors remain persistent barrier uh, to girls' education. What barriers uh, to education did you overcome uh, as, as the first in your family to graduate and pursue a career in engineering? And the next okay. question is, in your opinion, uh, what do we need to do to hold governments and international actors accountable for the level of re um, reorientation and additional financing needed to achieve gender equality in education? Over to you, Rabia. First of all, Benita, thank you so much for, uh, thank you, UNESCO, for giving me the opportunity to speak today on this forum. So, um, the answer of your first question, the obstacle, the, I think that one of the biggest obstacles was a lack of exposure. You know, when you don't have exposure of something, you cannot imagine the beauty. So I was like, I didn't know how studying science looks like, how studying engineering, how studying mathematics will look like. But I was really um, like into the traditional thought of going to school, first of all. But then I realized that I have so much energy and I want to achieve something. Um, my family basically, because I was very energetic and I uh, got like a distinction in my 10th grade, my family really insisted me to go to the medicine because they think that this is kind of feel for girls and it will be more comfortable for me. And even uh, when I went to cardiologist and he said the same thing that, you should study medicine because it will be more comfortable for you. But my calling was that I should do something that is not traditional. I should go for the thing because there is something beautiful in there. So everybody's stopping me. I wanted to achieve something. I wanted to go like I wanted to cross the boundary. So I uh, pursued mathematics in my 11th and 12th grade. And I got admission in engineering in computer engineering, in electronics engineering and environmental engineering. But I wanted to make an impact. So I chose environmental engineering. There were a lot of obstacles. There were a lot of relatives, you know, that you should go for medicine. It will be good as a girl. But I really overcame that obstacle. I, I listened to myself. I believed in myself. And believing in yourself would be the first and the last thing that will help you. And I believe that persistent confidence and that nature that will drive you to your goal you should be, you should show with your action that no, I'm going to do that. My parents were not giving me any attention. And then I achieved a lot of things. I got distinction in biology in 10th grade. So they were looking at me. Yes, there is something we should focus. And I'm very thankful to my sister and my mother who actually uh, supported me in the end. When they saw that I can do something, they believed in me. And uh, because, uh, because of the, trend, the culture, I was, I was thinking that, yes, when I will be 22, when I will be 23, I will have to get married. But now I think, no, after getting 
operate in the United States on a cultural exchange program that their horizons to educate. There is a lot of beautiful science happening and women can bring change. So now as an environmental engineer, I think that I can revolutionize in the field of you know, climate change and water quality issues. I want to address the air pollution and I'm really working towards it. And for your second question that what we can do, what we can ask governments to do. So basically, you know, in our culture, in our culture, there's no awareness and awareness is the key. When you don't have awareness, people are not gonna think in that way. So you have to bring the awareness and funding and do, uh, you know, you have to finance in the field, uh, in, in building more labs to give more research opportunities to girls. Because I remember that six years back, I didn't know about labs. I was very enthusiastic about chemicals. And I used to search for chemicals on the cell phone that how they look like. I always wanted to have a lab code, the goggles. And that fantasy of the science drives me to do something and to pursue education. And I'm like not only the first female to get an undergraduate degree, but not any male even, you know, pursue masters and PhD because they think that education doesn't work. And I said, no, it's worth it. And I will show you that it will. So, uh, you know, that we have to fund um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the sector, in the sector of science and in bringing and in creating awareness that women can do anything in these underdeveloped communities. And we have to, you know, create opportunities and incentivize them, you know, by incentivizing them by, you know, that if you will send your daughters to, you know, school, we will provide you scholarship or something like that. Just start with something small, you know. So, uh, like, this is probably, like, I would like to. And, um, yeah. And uh, one thing I would like to add, that people here think that marriage is everything. But I believe that marriage is not life. It is a part of life. And also people here think that, you know, uh, when you get married, it will solve every problem. And that's the cultural, social, and religious myth. And we need to really, like, we need to finish that concept. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ravia. That was very inspiring and very uh, wonderful presentation. And thank you for answering the questions. I'd like to thank all the respected speakers for their wonderful um, insights and very amazing um, remarks uh, in this in this uh, webinar. Um, so because of the time uh, limit, we don't have uh, time to have Q&A session. So um, uh, through this program, what we have heard today is a call to action, a call to widen our understanding of inclusive education to include all learners and foster education systems that embrace learner diversity of girls and boys women and men as a strength. A call to empower adolescent girls and young women through education. A call to make public policies far more inclusive based on examples of effective policies currently in force. A call to share best practices and expertise on how we can defend the importance of education as an enabler for girls and women's rights. In the year 2020, we stand at the crossroads. We need to harness the momentum of the Generation Equality Movement to support countries to build on their efforts towards a better education system based on the principles of equality and inclusion, where girls and boys, women and men have the same opportunities to achieve all their full potential and support each other. So having said this, we all have a role to play in making this happen and remember an equal generation is an educated generation. So I would like to thank all the speakers and thank you uh, organizing team for providing me with such a great opportunity. So I'd like to uh, conclude today's webinar uh, from my end. Thank you very much.